Strategic Farming Let's Talk Crops program. We're happy to have you and, and happy that you joined our session. This is actually part two of making herbicides work better. This uh, section is talked about de demystifying adjuvants. These sessions are brought to you by the University of Minnesota Extension, along with generous support from the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council and the Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council. I'm Dave Nicolai, University of Minnesota Extension Educator in Field Crops. We'd like to welcome our guest today, uh, Dr. Joe Eichley. Uh, Joe is Extension Weed Specialist at North Dakota State University, uh, along with a uh, longtime uh, weed scientist, Greg Dahl. He's an adjuvant development advisor. So with that, I'm going to turn the program over to uh, Dr. Eichley. And uh, Joe, uh, if you want to talk a little bit about adjuvants from your perspective, uh, and in terms of your experience at North Dakota State University, uh, go ahead, and then we'll have a break uh, partway in between before we uh, turn it back over to Greg. So take it away. All right. Thank you, Dave. So I'm going to park on this screen for a second, uh, because on, on this screen is a QR code to the 2024 weed guide uh, that we put together at NDSU. And I know both myself and Greg Dahl will be referencing some pages in this document. So if you've got a phone available, want to scan that QR code, uh, you can follow along electronically, or many of you might actually have a physical copy in your hand as well. But with that, I do want to go ahead and get into uh, some of the primary material. So part of what I want to do this morning is kind of go through uh, our different adjuvant classes and some of their primary functions and why we might use them. And that, I think, will set the stage very well for what Greg will expand upon, uh, probably a lot of the things that he did in his career with Winfield of, of kind of making adjuvants work better. But first, when I, when I think when we talk about adjuvants, I want to go through a timeline. So on this slide, and if I should probably pull up my uh, pointer here. So if, if we kind of go back a couple hundred years ago, we could we could at least say that we were using things like molasses and sugar as adjuvant properties for some of our sulfur and copper fungicides on grapes. So basically, you know, back then we had figured out, hey, some of these materials will help uh, some of our copper sulfur fungicides stick better to plants. It's that you could call the birth of adjuvants. But then go back to the early 1900s and we started realizing that oils can help our performance of some of our pesticides. And I'll go ahead and hop up here to the 1940s and 50s. So as we were discovering and marketing 2,4-D and then all the herbicides that followed, uh, non-ionic surfactant was discovered in the same time frame, as was the very important discovery that AMS or ammonium sulfate will increase our herbicide uptake. I do have to park here in the 1980s for just a little bit, and I know Greg Dahl will spend time on this as well. That's when methylated seed oils were introduced, and these were a discovery of Dr. John Nalawaya at NDSU. So MSOs were basically birthed at the institution that I'm currently at, and are a very important adjuvant for us uh, as, as we talk about our herbicides. Uh, and, and then basically we, we've only increased our knowledge since then. So there, there's three general categories that we can think about with adjuvants. Uh, so activator adjuvants are a lot of the ones that we typically think about when we usually use the term adjuvant. So these are helping to increase the biological activity of our pesticide. non ionic surfactants, crop oils, things that help our herbicides or pesticides work better. The two on the bottom, I'm, I'm not going to spend any time on these two today. I'm, um, Greg may uh, give a little bit of time to them, uh, but re really today is focused on one or number one there, the activator adjuvants. And so going through the different categories, uh, I'm going to start at the top here with non-ionic surfactants. What are they? Why do we use them? The primary function of an NIS is to reduce surface tension of water. And uh, I'll have some more pictures on the next slide, but this this uh, figure here at the bottom shows uh, basically what our goal is, is a water droplet by itself will be very circular. We want to decrease that surface tension to allow more surface area of that droplet to come in contact with the, uh, the leaf surface, give us more opportunities for that droplet to get into the plant. There are some other functions that will vary by a uh, brand of, of NIS. So you may hear these referred to sometimes as spreaders or stickers. These are generally surfactants, uh, but there are usually uh, additional things built into that formulation beyond the primary function of reducing that surface tension. And so this is a, a very kind of wide open category. 
But again, I, I just can't hammer home enough the primary function of an NIS. We are reducing surface tension of our water droplet. And this, uh, these series of pictures really drive that point home. So uh, on, on the left here, we have our, our water droplet by itself. Then we have uh, an adjuvant added in here as well. And basically showing from a side view and then more of a top view of the water droplet by itself. And then with an adjuvant, reducing surface tension, giving us more coverage on that surface area. So parafilm and cardboard show this very well, uh, but velvet leaf and uh, one of our primary weeds and the cowpea, which is a very uh, waxy leaf surface, also showing that reducing that water droplet tension, giving us more surface area coverage. And that's again, more opportunities for that droplet to, to get into that plant. Typical uses of an NIS. We're usually about a quarter percent volume to volume, sometimes up to a half a percent volume to volume. Um, and I, I basically have kind of walked my way through the rest of this, but, but very important adjuvant class for a lot of our, our uh, herbicides there. COCs or crop oil concentrates will be next on the list. Uh, some of us will still refer to these as, as petroleum oils, but I, I think most herbicide language is, is now updated to say COC or crop oil concentrate. And these, again, they can help with the wetting and spreading similar to an NIS, but one of the primary functions is moving uh, that herbicide or water droplet through the waxy leaf cuticle. So if you go back to chemistry 101, or maybe this would even be chemistry 201, of uh, just basic chemical properties and the, the um, saying that like dissolves like. So the leaf surface, the leaf cuticle of a plant is oil or waxy base and having an oil adjuvant will help get uh, droplets through that leaf cuticle rather than a hydrophilic or a water-based, water-loving, normal water droplet, having oil in there helps get across the leaf cuticle. So a lot of our herbicides are oil-based and adding additional oil in the form of a COC helps that droplet get into the plant. So most of our COCs, we typically talk about a, a a 1% volume to volume rate. This does change, particularly in, in our geography, as we use lower carrier volume. That's where a lot of times we, we will talk uh, pints per acre. Uh, and the, the main goal there is we want to have a minimum threshold of oil that gets a, across the field to help these herbicides get into the plant. So if you're applying 15 gallons per acre, this 1% volume to volume is, is a typically a very good goal to shoot for. If you're 10 gallons or less, that's where we talk one to two pints per acre. And again, that's just goes into the math behind all this of making sure we get enough oil onto these plants to help uh, these herbicides get through that cuticle and into the plant. And here on the bottom is, is our typical classes of chemistry, herbicide chemistry, that we would include an in oil with. And, and these are all uh, oil soluble herbicides, oil formulations. It's a lot of uh, EC formulations within these chemistries. But ALS herbicides, that's our group twos. Triazines are group fives. ACCAs is our group one herbicides or graminicides. HPPDs are group 27. And our PPO inhibitors are our group 14 chemistry. So a lot of very important chemistry there that we'll use both as burn down products and in crop. And oils help all of them. Now, kind of the next evolution of the crop oil concentrates is the methylated seed oil. And again, this was pretty much the brainchild of Dr. John Alawaya, is taking oil from some of our crops and then reacting it with either methanol or, eth or ethanol. So you might hear methylated seed oils. Uh, these are the preferred ones. There are some ethylated seed oils out there. Uh, but basically, MSO uh, is, is the ones that we typically will go with. Um, and again, this kind of is a, a more hotter version or a increased efficacious version of our crop oil concentrates. And I should, before I move on to the next category, uh, there, so some of the other things that we think about with MSOs is they, they do increase the activity of, of a lot of our oil-based herbicides. And so in crop or in season, you know, a lot of times some folks may not like the MSO adjuvants because you might get an increased crop injury. But from my perspective, when we talk about like soybean production, increased crop injury, soybeans can usually tolerate that. 
that also means you get an increased weed control. So if you think about uh, it from that perspective, an MSO is usually a very good choice. With our group 14 herbicides, those are where MSOs, in my opinion, really shine. And especially if you're using a group 14 herbicide in a burn down perspective. So things like Sharpen or Safafenacil, uh, even if you're using something like Sulfentrazone, so Spartan or Authority, those products. We typically rely on those for residual, but we can get some very good foliar activity out of those products, and especially when we include an MSO with them. And then kind of the next iteration or uh, of oil adjuvants is the high surfactant oil concentrates. So you might hear these as HSCOCs or HSMOCs, and that's just whether it's a high surfactant crop oil or methylated oil concentrate. And there, the basic chemistry behind these are you have at least half of that compound is oil, and you have usually 25 to the other 50% might be emulsifiers, usually some sort of uh, surfactant or organosilicone. And these were really brought to the market to help our tank mix products out. So if we think of something like glyphosate, which is very hydrophilic, likes water, and we'll just pick a, a corn program, a group 27 herbicide, one of our oil loving herbicides. This is where a high surfactant uh, concentrate will really help us out. So we basically have the surfactant in there to help out with glyphosate with some oils that help out with our, our oil loving herbicides. And so that's kind of why they were brought to market is, you know, take a tank mix like glyphosate and laudus or glyphosate and callisto. Well, what adjuvant would we want to use there when glyphosate wants an NIS? Uh, one of those group 27s wants an oil. Yeah, you could mix both those together. Pick your NIS of choice and your crop oil of choice. Or you have these products that kind of come standardized uh, for that purpose. So they're really brought to the market kind of for that purpose. Um, and, and they do get a lot of use uh, when we're mixing our hydrophilic and hydrophobic herbicides. So the, the last little bit that I want to present here uh, goes to page 132 in the weed guide. So for those of you who downloaded the weed guide, uh, just some of our basic uh, understandings of water quality and some of the other purposes why we might use adjuvants come from this section. And the first one is, is with water pH. And some of the things I just want to uh, discuss here with water pH, and I've, I realize now this got blurry as I increased the, the, the size of this picture that I took, is that some of our adjuvants can modify pHs. Um, this is very important, and I'll just focus on like the group two herbicides for now, the, the sulfonylureas that we might use, particularly in small grain production. These herbicides are more soluble at high pHs. So pH is above seven. So when we talk about the pH of our carrier volume, if we add something like glyphosate to the tank, that's that's gonna drop the water pH of our carrier volume because glyphosate likes to live in a low pH environment, forms better in lower pHs. Our group two sulfonylureas that we might use in small grains like higher pHs. Some of our adjuvants were, were basically produced to address this pH issues. And, and so if you hear like the basic blend adjuvants why do we use those? They raise the pH of our carrier volume. They make our group two herbicides more soluble to help get into the plant easier. So there's a lot more uh, detail on that in this paragraph and within that section, but just kind of want to touch briefly on water pH. And then the other thing that, that this, this section of the weed guide really drives home quite well is um, our water quality reports. So typically when you get a water analysis, you'll, you'll get a, a certain amount of calcium, magnesium, sodium, iron. Uh, and basically, what does all this mean? That's that's basically your cations, and there are anions as well in, in your water. How does that affect our spray solution? The other big thing, well, Dr. John Nalawai did a lot of good things. MSO was the one I touched on. The other one was, was he really helped develop this formula here on the slide. And so when you get a water quality analysis, you'll get your uh, parts per million of potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, iron in your water. And what that's telling you is how many cations you have in that water. One of the things that we often use, and in, in, uh, particularly from the academic side, we always talk about ammonium sulfate as one of our greatest water conditioners. And that's because the, the ammonium side will bind to weak acid herbicides. I'll touch on that in a minute. But the, uh, the sulfate side, will help tie up these hard 
of these hard water cations so that they don't bind to our weak acid herbicides. So Dr. Nalawaya did, did help go through and, and develop this formula of how much ammonium sulfate do I need to add into water to tie up these hard water cations? And that's what this formula shows. So if you have 100 parts per million of potassium in your water formula, you multiply that by 0 0.002 and then add all these formulations together. That's how much AMS you need in a, per 100 gallons just to condition the water. And that's the important part there, because if you do that math on your water analysis, sometimes it might be two pounds per 100 gallons is all you need just to condition the water. But the other important part is the detail here at the bottom, is that a lot of our weed species, lamb's quarters, velvet leaf, they have uh, some cations on the leaf surface. And those can also bind our weak acid herbicides. So due to that and some other reasons, that's basically why we, we want the minimum of eight and a half pounds uh, per 100 gallons of AMS. So you may only need two of those pounds to condition the water. The rest are really helping us avoid uh, some uh, cation antagonism on leaf surface as well. Last little bit I want to talk about here, and I think Greg will expound on this some, is that not all adjuvants are created equally. And, and, and I know Greg will hammer this home when he talks about uh, certification programs for adjuvants. So this is some research of, of my predecessor, Dr. Zollinger. We had a, a couple site years from 93 to 95, and then from 2005 and 2006, looking at glyphosate with a bunch of different, in this case, surfactants, all applied at the same rate. And basically when we had glyphosate by itself, uh, 49 to 68% control of grasses, then adding adjuvants. So if I focus on the, the mid nineties, anywhere from increasing up to 74% control or some, uh, in this case, basically did nothing. So some of these same marketed as surfactants, in this case for grass control with glyphosate did not improve the activity. Some greatly improved. Pretty similar results from the mid 2000s as well. It was a major take home from, uh, from Dr. Zollinger on, on this research as well. For all leaves, kind of a similar story. So when, when you're also looking through and shopping with adjuvants, knowing you're getting a quality one is of the utmost importance as well. And this is just kind of some, some research um, uh, as all part of that same study, looked in a few different categories. So rather than just surfactant, here's a surfactant plus an AMS fertilizer. In this case, we have some uh, products that that will do both those things together or some tank mixes. And again, showing that uh, the response may vary. Similar set of data there. So the, the last thing I do wanna to touch on is just with ammonium sulfate, why we often preach about ammonium sulfate being one of the best things that we can use from a water conditioning standpoint or sorry, not from water conditioning standpoint, from a tank mixing with our herbicides, particularly our weak acid herbicides. And this gets into chemistry within the cell of plants. So on the slide here, we have the cell wall, so the outside part of the cell, the plasma membrane, which herbicides will need to get through to get into the cytoplasm to ultimately get to the binding site uh, that we're trying to kill our, all these weeds with. And there is a difference in pH uh, within the cell wall versus within the cytoplasm. And we have basically these proton pumps within the plasma membrane. So what does ammonium help with? Basically with, with these, uh, these proton pumps and getting into a higher pH environment, the weak acid herbicides will bind to this, uh, this ammonium, will be basically be able to get through the cell wall, and then the herbicides will then be more or less locked into the cytoplasm. So all of our weak acid herbicides, why do they work better with AMS? This is also a big part of the story, is it helps get us into the cell where that herbicide can then really get to work. And so just a, a couple, um, I guess one more resource for those who have some drive time and, and folks on podcasts. Uh, I'm I'm part of one. We call it the War Against Weeds. We do have one or two uh maybe even three episodes on adjuvants. I know we had Greg Dahl on for a good 30 to 45 minutes to talk about adjuvants. So feel free to check that out if you want to focus more on adjuvants. Uh, uh, we do have the, the episodes titled appropriately 
So you should be able to find those episodes. And then again, QR code here on the bottom right of the screen to bring you back to that weed guide. So no, Greg is going to hit on that as well. With that, my little portion of the lecture is done. So yeah, we before we let you Greg yeah. and questions along the way or however you want to handle it, Dave. Well, I think before we let you go, Joe, we have a couple of minutes here, I think, and then we'll have some other time at the end. But do you want to mention anything about um, the in terms of just some general recommendations when we think about NIS and we think about situations involving, uh, you know, drier than normal conditions? Uh, we had a lot of drought in places in Minnesota and so forth this last year and so on. Um, but what's your what's your feeling in in general if we're at weather extremes and in a post emergency season we run into these uh, more stressful weather weather conditions um uh if the label allows for it is is um uh, especially like on nis uh, a good thing to at least check out yeah so so as conditions become more extreme particularly in a drought that's where often when a label allows flexibility of choose a surfactant or choose an oil, that's where we will often focus on using an oil in a droughty situation. One of the primary reasons behind that is the fact that in a drought, the cuticle, the leaf cuticle of plants will increase because they're trying to retain water throughout the day. So that, that waxy leaf cuticle will actually get thicker on weeds, crops as well, during a drought. And so switching to an oil adjuvant in that case will help penetrate that thicker leaf cuticle. And so that's one of the reasons why when we get into droughty situations, it, you might get recommended switch to an oil adjuvant. Uh, that's a primary reason. The other one, and I probably could have talked about this a little bit more with, with some of our oils, certainly, is they do have a humectant type property to them. And so having an oil-based uh, droplet will decrease the rate of evaporation. And so we're also having that droplet on a leaf plant in liquid form longer, given more opportunity to be absorbed into the plant. So certainly droughty situations, why do we recommend switching to oils in many cases? Those are the two driver reasons. Well, I've got two questions that popped up. I'm going to save one till later on, but I am going to ask this one real quickly before we bring Greg up. And that is granular AMS versus liquid AMS which is better. So let me just touch on that a little bit. And then along with that, I guess we do have a range of AMS, you know, in terms of that, is there any harm in going with a higher rate of AMS other than the financial implications? So those are the last two things before I get to uh, Greg. Right. So, so granular versus liquid, the, the only, you know, the only real difference there is convenience and costs. And so granular AMS is going to be as cheap as it gets but some folks don't like to handle bags or don't like to wait for that to, to dissolve into water or flush it through the induction cone and then let it dissolve in water in the tank. So if you want to get through at, at the cheapest budget possible, granular AMS is, is very good uh, and, and I've, I'm definitely recommended. Just keep in mind that you will have to wait for that dissolve in, to dissolve into water. And when we're pulling 33 degree well water out of the ground, give it a couple extra minutes. Liquid AMS was basically created as a convenience factor, and and the cost does go up a bit. And so, you know, basically, it will it, you don't have to wait for it to dissolve into water. You can you can increase your mixing speed, but it's going to cost you a little bit extra. So that's really the main difference between those two. As far as rate, yeah, if you want to go higher, that that's certainly uh, okay in my book. It, it will cost you more. You know, so a lot of herbicides will mention eight and a half pounds per one hundred gallons or maybe a, a pound per acre, up to 17 pounds per 100 gallons, or maybe two or three pounds per acre. Again, you're basically doubling or tripling your AMS cost, but that's a buck or two compared to the $50 of herbicide you're going to add into that tank anyways. So more AMS is better in my opinion. I, I actually prefer to stay on the higher end. Um, it, it's just you know an extra dollar or two compared to everything else you're adding into that tank. And, and for me, it's it's an easy dollar or two investment per acre. Well, very good, Joe. We're going to ask you to hang on there. Um, and I'm going to, and we're going to have more opportunity for questions here at the end. But I'm going to switch it back over to uh, Greg Dahl. And uh, Greg, if you're ready to uh, go ahead and uh, share your slides, 
and, and on the uh, screen. I think everything should work. Uh, we'll hear some uh, insight from you in terms of your experience uh, in industry. Um, you also spent some time at the university system, so you've seen a lot of water under the bridge, so to speak. Um, but let's talk a little bit about uh, adjuvants from your perspective. So take it away. Thanks, Dave, and thanks, Joe. That was that was really good. <clears throat> um, from my point of view, I've been really blessed to have been in, in a lot of the right places at the right time. I was at NDSU when a lot of when Nell Y was making a lot of these discoveries, and he would sit and explain them to us, and uh, it was it was just wonderful. And and then we've been able to take a lot of that knowledge and and develop it into some really wonderful adjuvant systems um and one of the things with this topic it's there's so much here we just can't cover it in an hour so i'm going to try and do a few things uh to give you some other sources of, of information that you can use um my my previous boss um put this together uh on and what we're doing is we're comparing um herbicide performance with or without different adjuvants. And so uh, he went and he looked at uh, a few thousand uh, herbicide plus adjuvant trials and picked out the, uh, the results from that. And so the first thing that I've got here, if a herbicide requires the use of an adjuvant and you don't use one, uh, what, what can happen? And what we found was that we can have anywhere from 30 to 90% reduction in weed control uh, when we don't use an adjuvant when we should. And, and a good example of that, if you go out and apply, um, say, Sharpen without an, any adjuvant, uh, it's going it, to, it'll be hard for you to even see any level of symptomology. Whereas if you put a good adjuvant with Sharpen, you're going to get nearly complete control. And so that's the difference you can have not having an adjuvant compared to uh, having the right adjuvant. And then the second thing we have is, well, what if you pick the wrong type of an adjuvant? For example, you pick a non-ionic surfactant and you should have used an oil adjuvant um, or the flip-flop of that. And what we see there is there was anywhere from uh, five to 50% less weed control um, when we use the wrong adjuvant. And then if you do the flip-flop, say you're supposed to use a non surfactant and you use an oil adjuvant, you may actually in increase the amount of uh, crop injury that you get to the crop. And, and so that's important. And then this third one is, is uh, kind of interesting. So we took things that were in the right adjuvant class, but some of them are built cheaper. They're not quite as good. And then that some of them are built better and they and they perform better. And so using a just good enough adjuvant versus a premium adjuvant, you can end up with five to twenty five percent less weed control uh, if you don't use a premium adjuvant. So we're trying to um, hopefully you'll use uh, a really good quality adjuvant and get the performance that you're looking for. Um, come on here. I'm kind of locked up here. Right, there we go. Um, so there are some adjuvant researchers I want to point you out uh, to you, uh, and hopefully you'll go get them. Uh, most all of these are free on the internet, or or if you want a paper copy, they there's a minimal cost. The first one is called a Compendium of Herbicide Adjuvants, and I use this thing. I'm never more than 50 feet away from my copy of this. And it's, it's a good thing of telling you what category a particular adjuvant is in. And so that's a really nice source. Uh, when this was started, it was uh, much smaller than that. Now there's about 800 products listed in this one uh, and uh, lots of different classes of adjuvants. And then um, I want to make you aware, uh, you can go to CPDA uh, and they're, uh, they do a lot of adjuvant training and they have uh, a lot of adjuvant classes that they put on. They're usually 45 minutes to an hour on different uh, topics about adjuvants. 
and uh, they're all recorded and you can just uh, download them and, and play them. I do want to point out this one. Um, you can sign up for this one. Uh, CPDA is going to have uh, an uh, adjuvants and aerial application uh, webinar on, on Thursday, February 22nd at one o'clock. It is a free program, but you do need to register for it, and I encourage you to attend. Um, another topic that, uh, or a, a piece of information that's very good, I, I also have this next to me most of the time. Um, it's called Adjuvants in the Power of the Spray Droplet. It's from Purdue uh, Extension. It's very, very well done, and it explains a lot of the different classes of adjuvants uh, uh, that Joe kind of uh, bri briefly uh, discussed, uh, but it talks about activator adjuvants, utility modifiers, all the different classes and what they do, and they can do some amazing things. And then uh, we were talking about CPDA providing information. Uh, CPDA also has a uh, certified adjuvant program where manufacturers of adjuvants can submit their adjuvants to CPDA along with label. They have to have safety and chemistry testing with it. Uh, they provide all this information to CPDA and, and it's reviewed by a board. And if the uh, board approves it, it becomes a CPDA certified adjuvant. And if you look at many of the adjuvants that are not the adjuvants, if you look at many of the herbicides that are on the market, you'll find a statement there that says uh, this company, uh, if a adjuvant is required, recommends using a CPDA certified adjuvant. And uh, they have in there what the adjuvants are, uh, what their name is, what, what class of adjuvant there are. And one of the things that's happened over the last 30 years, there's a lot of combination adjuvants where we'll take a water conditioner, add a surfactant, uh, add drift control, uh, different things like that. And so we have a lot of these uh, convenience products and uh, some of them can be very good. Some of them are not as good because you can only put so much in a gallon. And when you do that, you have to make a ratio. And a lot of times you have to make a concession that uh, you're just not gonna get everything in there that you want. And most of the time people will uh, sacrifice some of the uh, water conditioning. Uh, so a much higher product, a lot of these products will work better, uh, but uh, that's something that you have to deal with. Um, I was pleased to work with Winfield United and its predecessor companies for 26 years. I just retired at the end of the year. Uh, we've got the Innovation Center. I was proud to work there and we've done a lot of neat things. We've got a lot of wind tunnels and stuff like that. We do a lot of adjuvant work there. And it was nice to be part of that process and figure out a lot of the things and learn that some of the old information was in fact very good information. So I'd like to thank John Nellowai for all his contributions. He actually developed, did research that developed a, three different adjuvant technologies. Don Penner uh, created the Cornsorb technology uh, which added to AMS, made wonderful products. Uh, Joe Janowski uh, was my uh, boss previously, and he was a genius working on these things and produced dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, really nice adjuvants. And then, of course, Richard Zollinger did a lot of work with, with adjuvants and teaching about adjuvants. So uh, going into some of the things, um, Right now, we've got a lot of people doing new things. Uh, uh, herbicide applications have gotten really complex. And so everybody hates to hear about doing a jar test, but uh, it is really important to do jar tests because you don't, if you're going to have a problem, you want to know about it and you don't want to have a thousand or 1200 gallons of, of snot or cottage cheese and try and clean out that sprayer. You don't want to have it happen. And some of these uh, products, they don't play nice. And some of the times the uh, products will work well until you put that last thing in the tank and then you just bloop and you got crap. Um, 
So one of my first suggestions as you're getting into the year, uh, I'm actually going to start with one before this. We have very few problems when the sprayers are cleaned. So I suggest always starting with a clean sprayer. And as soon as you spray what you need to spray, I suggest cleaning it out again. You'll have a lot fewer problems. Now, having said that, I uh, warn you that things that need to get wet need to get wet. We have dry products. We have uh, SCs, which are solids that are suspended in a liquid. And they really need to get wet before you put in something like an oil. If you do that, if that oil grabs that dry or grabs that SC, uh, the water's not going to be able to get in there. You've got a problem. And uh, it's something that can easily have been prevented. And then in addition to things needing to get wet, um, it takes a lot more time when it gets cold. And so here we're looking at uh, two samples of water with uh, dry AMS. Dry AMS will completely dissolve. Uh, but if you've got 90 degree water, we will have, um, it'll take about six minutes for that to completely dissolve in the water. And then if you have 40 degree water, um, it's going to take 13 to 18, 19 mi minutes for that dry AMS to actually dissolve in that cold water. And, and, and just think about what you're doing. Not only is the water going to be cold early in the spring, sometimes the chemicals that you're bringing out are going to be cold, things like that. Things that are cold do take a lot more time to mix. Uh, another thing that I would like to uh, tell you about, plants don't drink rocks. And it sounds dumb, plants don't drink rocks. But if things turn into a crystal, they're not going to get into the plant. And so um, if we have things like calcium or magnesium and they're combining with glyphosate, they're going to form crystals. Uh, and you probably can't bring them back. Some of the herbicides will, uh, will have evaporation take place and they'll turn into a crystal. You may be able to re-wet it and get it to come in, but if it doesn't re-wet, uh, or if the plant or if the chemical can't be redissolved, it's not going to get in the plant and it doesn't work. So we really want to do two things. We want to make sure things stay liquid so they can get in the plant. And so we're using things like uh, our water conditioning. And, and then I'm also using the same uh, uh, warning for when we're spraying in really dry conditions. Um, we'll have a lot of evaporation going on, especially if we're in a drought, we're gonna have a lot of evaporation going on. And so we want to use an oil adjuvant or something like that to reduce the amount of evaporation because we want to think, we want our herbicides to stay liquid for as long as we can. And some of these things in a really dry environment, you may only have five or 10 seconds to get the herbicide actually to get into the plant. And so we really want things to stay wet as long as possible. Um, here's a map of water quality across the United States. And you can see in both Minnesota, we have some hard water situations. In North Dakota, we have a lot of, of hard water situations and they go on up into Canada. And Joe did a nice job actually where that information is in the weed control guide, North Dakota weed control guide. That is the best comp compilation of water quality information that I'm aware of. And so I encourage you to go there. Um, the uh, information is wonderful and, uh, and we use it uh, in our water testing programs and things like that. Um, kind of switching different uh, in a different area. Uh, Nalawaya uh, developed the MSOs and uh, and that was a wonderful technology. We were involved uh, as Winfield uh, United and its predecessors in developing the high surfactant oil concentrate uh, category of adjuvants, both with the petroleum oils and with the MSOs. And one of the things we want to do with all of those things is we do want to make sure we have enough oil. We don't want to become oil limiting. And Joe mentioned if you have 
uh, really small uh, gallons per acre, uh, 10 or less. Uh, you can actually become water limiting with some of these products and are, are oil limiting with some of these products. And so you don't have enough oil there to, to do the job. And so we want to make sure we stay high enough. If you're at uh, 15 or 20 gallons of water per acre, you uh, probably do have enough oil there. You're not oil limiting, but it's something to make sure uh, that you do. I'm showing this map here. There's kind of an orange area and uh, I don't like the break between the orange and the yellow. I think it's too far west. Uh, basically, and I draw a line from Canada to Texas. And uh, basically, about two counties in in Minnesota, um, I, I would consider them and everything west of them to the Rocky Mountains that when you're comparing a crop oil concentrate or petroleum oil to an MSO type product, the MSO product will generally look better as far as performance and everything like that than the, the uh, petroleum oil product will. Now, if we have a drought, that line goes east. And so MSOs will work farther east better than the old petroleum oil products. And if we have really good growing conditions, stuff like that, the line goes west. But basically in, in our part of the geography, I would go at least two counties into Minnesota um, and kind of draw a line there. Anything west of that, MSOs should generally work much better than a petroleum oil type product for the same thing. Uh, and I'll just kind of leave it at that. Um, and then I wanted to show you something. Here we've got some stuff we did at the uh, Innovation Center. Uh, we basically are using fluorescent dye. We're putting it on a leaf surface and we're shooting straight down the side of the leaf surface. And you can see that first uh, one, it says no treatment. There's no adjuvant with it. So that dye is not entering the plant. And then underneath that, we have three MSO type products. One is a standard MSO. The other two are high surfactant oil concentrates that are MSO based. And you can see all three of those products. We're getting a lot more penetration down into the leaves using those MSOs. I just wanted to show that off. And then uh, another thing that I've got here, uh, going way back into history, um, the first glyphosates had a warning on them that said, uh, do not use crop oil concentrates or MSOs uh, because they're antagonistic to glyphosate. And they were. And, and to my knowledge, everything that was used as a crop oil concentrate or an MSO um, in the, uh, in the 90s um, were in fact antagonistic to glyphosate. Um, here's some data that Nella Wyatt uh, uh, generated uh, from 1995. We're using a glyphosate uh, uh, herbicide. There is no surfactant in this herbicide. It's just the glyphosate active and um, then we added AMS or pre or uh, a non ionic surfactant or AMS and a non ionic surfactant. And you can see we got better performance. And when we added AMS plus surfactant, we got a lot better performance. And then if you look at the last three bars, we have a 17% crop oil concentrate and we have two MSOs. And you can see that, in fact, we do have antagonism going on. We are having less weed control um, when we add those, those oil adjuvants. And so it's important to get one that's not uh, going to cause antagonism to your glyphosate. And so um, early on in the early 2000s, uh, we actually asked someone to build us um, a crop oil concentrate that was glyphosate friendly and the Superb HC was the first one like that. Now there are a few more products that are glyphosate friendly, but that isn't something to be uh, concerned about. Now, if your glyphosate rate is low, 
you, oftentimes you can pick up the uh, the glyphs uh, oil antagonism uh, from the uh, the oil product on the glyphosate. If your glyphosate rate is really high, you may not see the antagonism. And and so uh, if you're using glyphosate with oil, I would keep my glyphosate rate high. And then uh, another thing you can look at is is in fact is it is it uh, glyphosate friendly as an oil. Um, going into surfactants. Uh, they don't like to mix, and we need to worry about gravity. The Anything that's water-based is going to go to the bottom. Anything that's oil-based is going to go to the top. And trying to mix things is a hard thing to do. Uh, on the left-hand side, we've got an oil and a uh, and water, and you can clearly see they're not mixing, kind of like uh, Italian salad dressing. Over on the other side, we've got an oil uh, with water, and we've got a, an emulsifier in there, and we get a nice uh, mix of that. And um, the surfactants, the emulsifiers, they do work differently. Some work much better than others, so there can be differences that way. But this shows what, what they're kind of do. Um, and then uh, I'm going to show you this thing, which is, this is a hair leaf surface, like a velvet leaf or like kochia. And you can see a droplet trapped on hair. And this uh, droplet has no surfactant in it. And if it doesn't reach that green surface, it's not going to work. And it doesn't work. And then if you uh, actually add a surfactant to it, boom, it gets to the leaf surface. That's something it can do. I, um, it also will do the same thing on waxy surfaces it'll spread out get where we want it to be so surfactants can do a lot of things and one of the things i want you to think about is all of the surfaces you got there you're looking at the leaf surface and the water droplet you're looking at um the inside of the tank the inside of the hoses uh you're looking at uh, where oil and water mix that's a surface where you have the water and air mix, that's a surface and you can get a lot of foaming and things like that. And there's a lot of com combination products. Um, we have tank cleaners, which usually are a very high pH product mixed with a surfactant. We have um, products where we wanna generate foam, which uh, will do that. We got products where we don't wanna generate foam or anti-foams or defoamers. They're basically a surfactant that's working to break the foam. Uh, you've got uh, compatibility agents, which uh, have a very low pH and are, are added to a surfactant to solubilize things, things like that. And so there, there's surfactants are involved in a lot of combination products. And uh, one more uh, topic is droplet fate. Um, droplets that are big enough have to land. Gravity will pull them out of the air. They land. Hopefully they're in a good size for you. If they're too big, uh, they're going to bounce off. Uh, they're going to fall to the ground, things like that. Uh, if they're too small, um, then gravity actually isn't strong enough to pull them out of the air. So they will go wherever the wind currents go. And, uh, and that's a bad thing. We want to make sure our droplets are big enough that they have to land and we don't want them to be so big that we lose uh, coverage. And uh, and we can do a lot of things with nozzles and we can do a lot of things with adjuvants to adjust the size of our droplets to get where we wanna be. In old history, and it is old history, uh, the polychromides were, were uh, some of the first drift control products we had. They make things thicker, um, they, uh, Droplets don't break up as, as nicely, things like that. Um, and, and so we do get some drift control out of that. And we have to watch which nozzles we use that with. Uh, and uh, another uh, technology, which I'm not going to talk about, is the invert oil uh, type technology, which worked for a while. And uh, there may be some still on the market, but it, it's uh, there's other things that it have replaced it. Glor behaves a lot like the polyacrylamides and uh, and works the same way. It thickens the, the uh, uh, spray mixture. 
um, slows down uh, droplets breaking up and we end up with bigger droplets. So we do get drift control. We also uh, may have coverage issues if the droplets are too big. And then we've got these uh, oil emulsion uh, drift control technology. I was involved in the, the discovery of this technology and, it, and it's been wonderful. What happens is it changes the breakup of the droplets and the droplets you leave the nozzles going a higher velocity. Between those two things, um, we're able to get better deposition where we want it and less drift to where we don't want it to be. What happens is we don't get a lot of the smaller droplets actually forming. We get the droplets in the middle forming and we don't really create any bigger droplets. So that's a nice thing. And then we have another uh, class, which is the ethoxylated lecithin. And this does also uh, help with deposition and it does help with reducing drift. And uh, here you can just see a situation. The cornfield was sprayed with glyphosate. We got a wheat field there. We used one of the MF, uh, the emulsion type uh, DRT products and you can see, and we had a pretty nasty wind there. And you could see things landed very well where we wanted them to be. And that's uh, what I plan to present, Dave. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, one a quick question. Maybe this might be for uh, for Joe that that came in from uh, uh, from the listeners and so forth. And in, uh, it's um, kind of a relative here of, of Paraquat on Diquat. And the, the participant asked, what adjuvants should be recommended with a Diquat burn down in dry conditions? You know, water volume, 10 to 20 gallons, say, for example. And, you know, dealing with pigweed, buckwheat, lamb's quarters, et cetera. Anything off the top of your head, uh, uh, Joe, in, in terms of that? Because uh, you're faced with maybe a little bit more of this than, than we are farther east. Yeah, so... So with both Paraquat and Diquat, all the research that we have shows that uh, non-ionic surfactant is the right uh, adjuvant for that system. I don't know if we have any data on like severe droughts. In a severe droughty situation, I could see an oil uh, being beneficial. But but basically, we're, we get a 10 to 20, I should say a 10% bump with a surfactant compared to an oil with straight Paraquat almost every time we apply it. If you're mixing with something like Sharpen, so oftentimes we'll use like a Paraquat Sharpen, or maybe even in Canola, we could probably use a Diquat Sharpen tank mix for desiccation. That's where I lean, I lean more on what Sharpen requires. So that's where the MSO right. would be beneficial there because it greatly enhances the activity of that group 14 herbicide and it's and it doesn't really affect paraquat all that much in, in that tank mix situation. So by itself, surfactant, and again, we don't have any data on a severe drought situation, but surfactant when you're just trying to die, kind of desiccate and dry it down would be my go-to. Um, the next question, uh, we actually answered part of this earlier, but it refers back to AMS for uh, Joe and Greg. And the question is, is AMS helpful for all chemistry or just with glyphosate? And then there was a part of this question is, is too much in regards, in other words, can you put in too much and end up with crop damage and, and affect product uh, efficacy? So kind of a two-part question. I, I think we talked about range there, but uh, maybe uh, segue into here. Uh, can we use it with other herbicides, obviously, and get some uh, benefit? Or should we just you know go back to the label? And any weak acid herbicide, which is really most of the herbicides we use in crop is going to benefit from ammonium sulfate. No. And then, yeah, so we, we kind of talked some ranges, but there's not a high end of the range that I'm aware of that we can cause crop injury with AMS. I know in Illinois, a few years ago, they had, they ran up to like uh, 20 pounds per acre or 30 pounds per acre. And we're not seeing injury, maybe some yellowing at that very, very high rate that's far outside the range that we're going to be using uh, in, in any given spray application. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I would agree with that, that uh, um, we haven't seen issues with, with injury with, with AMS. Um, and I would say more than uh, I have seen antagonism with crazy high rates of, of AMS with glyphosate, but I mean, it, it's very rare. And, um, 
most of the time it just kind of plateaus. I mean, it, it gets to a certain amount and, and you just don't get any more control. It'll just plateau on you. Okay. The next question, Greg, maybe back to your previous employer, you might've dealt with this. This is just moving outside of herbicides. And one of the questions came in, what about adjuvant use and selection type with insecticides and fungicides? And I realize that's very broad, you know, and we can segue back to look at the label, but, um, in general, are we looking at um, surfactants as, as beneficial there? But I mean, this is outside of the herbicide side of it in, in terms of that. What's been your experience there? So so you, you've got different classes of, of insecticides and fungicides, stuff like that. Um, and, and, we and we have found some things that, that are quite helpful. Um, the surfactants are, are good. Uh, we have... Uh, couple classes of um, of uh, high surfactant oil concentrates which which work really good and and one of the things I would I would uh, kind of go in that direction is um, um, we don't want things to evaporate we don't want things to dry out we want them to behave themselves stuff like that and so if we're using a high surfactant oil concentrate especially one that has some drift control in with it as well, um, those products work really good in that situation because we're keeping them from uh, evaporating. Um, hopefully they will um, be fairly heavy and hopefully they'll be sticky. Those are the things I like with um, insecticides or fungicides. Okay. Uh, next question. Actually, Joe, uh, if, if, if somebody didn't ask it, I was going to ask this and, and you've done some work with this and, and now we've got, we're now we're going to get more, uh, mixed partners, and that is for people that want to use Enlist and Liberty, and Liberty. Okay, so Enlist plus Liberty. Do you have any recommendations, or is there a need for any adjuvants when you mix those two together? Uh, you know, obviously for in a in a crop field. Yeah. So so basically, every time that we apply that tank mix and research, we use ammonium sulfate. And that's really all that we've used with that system. And that, that has worked great for us. I, I know that there's some, some recommendations now uh, in some geographies, particularly the more arid ones, of adding oil with Enlist. But we also have some information of oil can at times antagonize liberty. So without having any data to back up a claim one way or the other, I just know that when we mix ammonium sulfate with Enlist 1 plus liberty, at least in Fargo, and east and south that's worked very well okay um one of the last questions here for for both of you and that is you know looking across the range of herbicides and one of the questions came in how do the adjuvants affect the breakdown of herbicides in other words uh, how long does it take to break themselves down in, in terms from an adjuvant perspective not just from a herbicide so I'm assuming here we're talking about an application where there's a with a tank mix and so forth. Um, is there any effect here on the breakdown of the herbicides themselves because of the adjuvant component that's been added into the tank? Kind of a two part question, and I suppose it's all we can say it all depends. It, it depends on chemistry and pH. Okay, which way do you, which way we're we talking here? Higher pH, lower, or what's going to break down faster? It so, depends on herbicide. Yeah. yeah. Do, do, do they want a, a high pH? Um, then the acids will be uh, bad for them. Do they want a low pH? Then the, the high pH products would be bad for them. Okay. There, there's some chemistry like uh, our diphenyl ethers, which are Cobra, Flexstar, Blazer, that they break down relatively quickly at a high pH. Okay. So if you had a anything that raised the pH above seven, then those type of chemistry will break down fairly quickly in a spray tank. And and and, and I would throw this this thing out uh, also, Dave, which is that some adjuvants will help the herbicide get in the plant faster. That's a good thing. Some uh, adjuvants will actually may protect against UV breakdown, things like that. And so, so uh, hopefully they'd the adjuvants in a lot of cases will make the product stay effective longer. Okay. 
Um, another question came in when using um, Liberty and uh, Clethodim together. Would you use an adjuvant? In most cases, yes. And that's driven by, well, that's going to be driven by clethodim um, yep. formulation. So, for instance, the select max formulation, you really don't need oil, but you would be beneficial in that situation, Liberty, select max, having an NIS in there. Basically, every other clethodim formulation, you need oil. Yep, I agree. What about, um, we talked a lot about residual herbicides and the need for that. Is there any benefit here for adding residual uh, an adjuvant to help improve residual control? I'm, I'm assuming we're talking here probably about, um, you know, residual from a herbicide standpoint, but uh, I'm not sure. So, so again, it would be a, it depends. And uh, one of the things the adjuvant can do is get more product where you want it to be. That's a good thing. Um, if the uh, particular residual herbicide was affected by UV uh, breakdown or things like that, you may be able to have an adjuvant to help protect that. How, how affected would that be? Um, you may get a few more days. I, I, I don't see it being uh, something where you would get um, a long-term advantage from it. Yeah, they may be asking about some of these uh, soil adjuvants on the market. And what I can tell you is you can be in the most severe drought. If you want to make it rain, put out a soil adjuvant research trial. So there, there's a lot of a lot of good stuff we can do in the lab, but I have not seen a benefit in research of those soil adjuvants. But again, if you want to make it rain, put it out a trial where you need a drought. Last last question here, and this is, it's a little bit of a tank mix question. So there is some things here, a little bit about efficacy, but there also might be compatibility issues. And that is going back to the Enlist, is tank mixing Enlist, Liberty, and glyphosate. And the question is, is it wrong to put them all together? So I, I guess you could think about it from a compatibility standpoint. You could think about it from an efficacy standpoint. But Joe, you've done some you know work on there and putting them all together. Yeah, so you know, I, I encourage putting them all together. What you need to look out for is you, you need to take your time when mixing all those products together. So particularly if we're using like a potassium salt of glyphosate, you need to make sure that's fully dissolved in your water before adding a list and then make sure that's fully dissolved as well. So they, they all work great together from a mixing perspective and uh, efficacy perspective, but you can't add all the products, and especially if AMS is involved, you can't add them all together in the induction cone and flush it through. You're going to leave a lot of residue behind. And 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 I would I would add to that. Uh, when I first started, I mentioned that uh, uh, start with a clean sprayer, end with a clean sprayer. That's a one of the applications where I would suggest you need to start with a clean sprayer. And I wouldn't mix that mix up until I can actually spray. Then I would uh, mix it, I would spray it, and I would clean that sprayer out right away, and you should be fine. If you let things sit in that sprayer for any length of time, uh, you're going to have chemical reactions taking place, and you, you're creating a problem for yourself. Thank you very I was going to say thank you very much for... Uh... Uh, it, coming by today, and you are uh, you're both correct uh, in in terms of the um, uh, opportunity to learn about this. We could have gone along for you know for two hours uh, with that, but we uh, we have to cut it off here with that the opportunity to to email these folks uh, a, as well. I I know Joe especially at, at North Dakota State University. Uh, we appreciate the information. Uh, we also want to thank at this point in time the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council along with the Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council uh, for their funding. Uh